all sound to tears, uh, holding their heads, looking up at what's left of the World Trade Center, and just shaking their heads in disbelief. We still have a choice today. Non-violent coexistence. A violent core annihilation. We do not act. We shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time. Reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. It was in those dark days of 9-11 that interfaith communities united for justice and peace was founded. I called my friend Rabbi Leonard Bierman and Jim Lawson and Rabbi Jacobs, Louis Chase, Ed Bacon, Meher Hatu, Najir Kaja. And I said, we need to meet. We need to see what the religious community's response is to this tragedy. You can remember the day when there was a blackboard and we set about to give this organization a name. And every word meant something and has meant something for the last 11 years. And so the Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace was born. And we have met for 550 Friday mornings at 7.15. Interfaith. We knew that had to be the core of this work. We knew the traditions we had all come from. Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Sikhs and humanists and others. Communities. This was not meant to be just another group of leaders, of clergy, officially blessed into their face. This would be communities that would do the hard work we saw ahead of us. Interfaith communities for something and not just against something. Justice. We knew it had to start with justice and peace. And that was our ultimate. Interfaith communities united for justice and peace. My name is, yeah, good afternoon, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Kinman, my pronouns are he, him, and I am the rector here at All Saints Church. Uh, I would say welcome to All Saints Church, but that's something that you say when this isn't your home. Uh, this organization was born here and in many other places. Uh, and so instead of saying welcome, I just wanna say it is so good as always that we are here together. Now I said I'm the rector of All Saints Church and that title, Rector of All Saints Church, has a gravitas to it through no effort of my own, but through the dogged faithfulness of those who have held it before me. Primary, of course, among them, of course, is George Regas. I will always consider myself to be sitting in his chair with hope that we can incarnate anew for this generation what George led so many in incarnating in his. What George and the other amazing leaders who founded this organization led communities in incarnating was the conviction that God's love is the most powerful force in the universe, that it flows over and breaks down every barrier that humans might erect against it, that it is accessible to all and yet owned by none, and that it has the power to heal wounds, change hearts, and transform the world. It was that conviction that led George to pick up the phone in the wake of the terrorist attacks of September 11th, whose 20th anniversary we observe today, 
While our national leaders were preparing to meet violence with more violence, adding, as Dr. King said, deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars, George remembered the rest of what Dr. King said that day, that hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And so George reached out to leaders of love across many faiths, and together they sought courageously to stand in that most uncomfortable of places, the place of prophetic truth. As our nation prepared for war, George and these leaders of love gathered at 7.15 Friday mornings and organized for peace, not just among themselves, but in their communities. And that is how interfaith communities united for justice and peace was born. Now, I'm going to leave the rest of that story to those of you who are actually a part of it. And please know how grateful I am and all of us at All Saints Church are for your vision and your passion and your dedication to the truths of love and peace that run through all of our faith traditions. What I've been asked to do and how I would like to spend just a few more minutes this afternoon, and you know it's dangerous when a preacher says a few more minutes at this point. <laughs> It's with that question, how do we incarnate anew in this generation and the next, what ICUJP incarnated for a generation past unto today, to end systems of war and build a culture of peace? I have no absolute answers. And I do have some thoughts about what that task might be and where we need to look for that next generation of leaders of love. First, if it is even still out there, we need to dispel the notion that you have to hate or fear another to go to war with them. That can be the reason, but that doesn't have to be the reason. We go to war because we do not see the humanity in one another sufficiently or at all. We go to war because we see the other as a means to our own ends. We go to war when we dehumanize, when we objectify. The drivers of war are no longer hate and fear. They haven't been for a long time. The drivers of war are white supremacy and unfettered capitalism. They are the systems that dehumanize those we have learned to consider as the other. They are the systems that bind all of us. White supremacy and unfettered capitalism, those are the pillars that support and drive war and oppression. And it will take a generation and more of multi-faith, strategic, prayerful, militant, nonviolent love to bring those pillars down and replace them with pillars of equity, justice, and love. And it can be done. Right now, Afghan refugees are pouring into this country. And despite how xenophobic we can be as a nation, polls are showing that the vast majority of Americans approve welcoming them in and giving them homes. That shows the heart that we have when we are able to see each other as human. And that heart is bound by the systems that imprison us. We have hearts of compassion as individuals and as a nation, and yet we do not hold our leaders accountable to their heart. We do not hold corporations accountable to their heart, and increasingly we do not hold faith communities accountable to their heart. We do not hold ourselves accountable to our heart, and that is the source of violence and war. 20 years ago, when we used 9-11 as a pretext to invade Iraq and Afghanistan, the sin was not just the violence and war. The sin was our nation using a moment of humbling, a moment of national unity, a moment when we had the compassion of the world and not leaning into that love and common humanity, but instead using it to further our white supremacist capitalist agenda. We talk about the troops who lost their lives and limbs and whose psyches were shattered by trauma, and well, we should. And we talk about the civilians who suffered the same and worse, and well, we should. And we need to remember that contractors outnumbered soldiers in Afghanistan at least three to one. This was never a war. It was a murderous, hostile takeover of an economic asset for the profit of American multinational corporations. And we didn't care about the people hurt in the process because they were largely poor, 
largely black and brown, wholly inconsequential to and largely not seen as human by those making the decisions. And the reason the survivors are so traumatized is they're the ones who had to look each other in the eye and face the truth that it was another human being and not just a means of production or a, a barrier to acquiring an asset that they were maiming and killing. If we wait until troops are deployed or, or more likely now until drones are sent, we will never fulfill the core principles of this organization. The decisions that lead to violence are made long before in corporate boardrooms of wealthy white men. Fates are sealed with keystrokes and marketed to us like deodorant and cornflakes, not for the cause of freedom, but co to continue to strengthen the systems of white supremacy and unfettered capitalism to line the pockets of the white wealthy few. Consider this. The three largest military contractors in this country are Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Raytheon. In 2019, Lockheed Martin gave $7 million to political action committees and spent $13 million lobbying. Boeing gave $7.5 million to PACs, spent $12.5 million lobbying. And Raytheon gave $7 million to PACs and spent $12 million lobbying. And that was a really good investment by those companies because the same year, Lockheed Martin made $44.9 billion in arms sales. Boeing, $26.9 billion, and Raytheon, $24 billion. The 20-year murderous hostile takeover in Afghanistan was actually not a failure. It was an incredible success for the purposes for which it was waged. For from the moment it was declared until the ending of the last troops leaving, Raytheon's stock value increased 4.3 times, Boeing's stock value increased 10.7 times, and Lockheed Martin's stock increased 13.4 times in value. And who owns that stock? Families in the top 10% of income in this country own 70% of all the stock value in this country, and that number is going up. That's the task before us. And that is hard news and a wake-up call, because another hard truth is more and more. Communities of faith, like All Saints Church, are resembling more and more that which we are fighting against than that which we are trying to bring into being. The brilliance of ICUJP is that it is not just leaders, but that it is multi-faith community. And over the last 20 years, the faces of our gathered communities of faith have been changing, or maybe it is better to say that they have been staying far too much the same. There is as much and as deep faith in this world as there has ever been. And at least in Christianity, and I suspect maybe in other faiths as well, increasingly people are not choosing our communities of faith as their homes. And while that might be convenient for us to paint that as secularization and faithlessness, I don't believe it is. I believe it is an act of faith and integrity on behalf of these younger generations. Because more and more, our faith communities are becoming, and we have become, that which our faith implores us to oppose. We perpetuate white supremacy culture even in our communities that are not majority white. We hold ourselves not to our heart, but to the unholy trinity of attendance, buildings, and cash, which is inextricably connected to the unholy trinity of which Dr. King spoke, that of racism, poverty, and war. Our worship hours continue to be among the most segregated hours of the American week. At All Saints Church, we are a community of courageous justice, and I believe truly that is our heart. And yet the primary energy and primary fear present in this congregation, and on which I am judged as their rector, surrounds not how bold we are being in loving and attacking those pillars of white supremacy and unfettered capitalism, but in how many people are coming to our services, and what is the state of our physical plant, and how much our giving budget is. And that is why younger generations are leaving our communities of faith, not because our hearts are too small, but because our fear is too great. And they are forming new communities 
in the streets and, and online. And it is they, not people like me, who are the leaders for this next generation of work. Faithful activists, young, queer, black and brown, faithful activists who care more about the movement than the credit, who are willing to risk their lives and the lives of their organizations to do this work because they know this work is a matter of life and death. And that's where I'm going to end this afternoon with the proposition that this new generation of leaders of love may not be in this room or even watching this event online. They are working for al otro lado and caring for the George Floyd Memorial. They're spending their Friday nights and their Saturday and Sunday mornings in parks and on the streets and not in churches, mosques, and synagogues. And our job is not to get them into our places of worship, but to go where they are and let them lead us. Help remove the barriers to them claiming the power that is rightfully theirs. To let them inspire and lead us and teach us in the ways of liberation for such a time as this. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, all. I want to uh, thank Rector Mike for those profound prophetic uh, words uh, on this unusual and unprecedented day in the history of the United States of America. As you all know, uh, fearing our political leaders would choose war, but deeply committed to the best in people, the Reverend George Regus, joined together with the Reverend Jim Lawson, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, Dr. Mira Hatut, and other interfaith leaders and activists to form a new organization whose name and mission set a brave and hopeful movement on its course. Uh, today, we honor the Reverend George Regus for his vision in convening ICU-JP. He touched and inspired so many people, and you'll hear some powerful stories and memories about him in the next uh, hours. We are going to start in a few minutes with a video, and then you will hear uh, Dr. Jim uh, Lawson. I need to say that I'm Louis Chase, <laughs> the uh, Minister of Community Outreach at the Holman United Methodist Church, one of the founding members of ICUJP, and currently a board member of ICUJP. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Reverend James Lawson. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called the Reverend James Lawson Jr. the leading theorist and strategist of nonviolence in the world. Uh, Reverend Lawson has served as a moral and spiritual leader from Nashville to Los Angeles. In the 1950s and 60s, he taught the principles of peaceful resistance to the nonviolence movement for civil rights. In 1974, Reverend Lawson moved to Los Angeles where he served as pastor at the Holman United Methodist Church for 25 years and currently is pastor emeritus. He also served as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference West and was one of the co-founders of ICUJP along with Reverend Regus and, that, and those noble persons whose names I mentioned earlier. He continues his decades <coughs> of teaching on nonviolence and social movements with classes 
and monthly workshops. So I want to present to you now uh, Dr. James Lawson. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon on September 11th and the 11th on the 20th year uh, of 9-11. Uh, I want to uh, express my appreciation to all of you who are actively engaged in ICUJP in making it work and on this very important work that we do for peace and justice. Uh, as a nation, we are still not on the road towards where history would have us, or where, as I want to say, God would have us, or Allah would have us. Uh, at the present moment, we have a widely, widely divided nation without much understanding as to why we're so divided. I want to propose that the division in the nation is based upon the central issue of what and who we are as a people of the United States of America. I want to insist that the vision is largely out of the 20th century in the change that began in the middle of that century, especially through the Rosa Parks, not, uh, Martin Luther King nonviolent movement in America, especially through the work of people like John Lewis and Vera Carr and a whole host of people who caused the most important movement ever in the American nation to take place. Ostensibly, it was a movement to end racism and Jim Crow law and segregation in the United States. But in fact, it was a revolutionary movement for our nation to take hold of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States and the preamble to the Declaration of Independence are two critical historical documents and make them work for our nation or make we ourselves, we the people of the USA, use those historical documents rather than uh, a, a USA development of USA culture, which is in contradiction. And so uh, I don't think the attentions in our nation are primarily a Democratic Party, a Republican Party. Republican Democratic Party largely reflect our culture. I think the tension today is because the changes have begun and the forces that all along have worked on behalf of a different kind of society, plantation capitalism, for example, those resistance forces personified themselves in the people and the activity around the Trump movement. So I would call ICUJP to a recommitment to all of the issues that we must see as significant for the changes that this nation must still make. I wanna suggest one, we have to dis continue to dismantle the old forces uh, of conventional wisdom that include racism, sexism, violence, and plantation capitalism. We must continue to dismantle our minds, our hearts, our spirits, and we must continue to dismantle the structures of oppression 
that are still too um, visible all around the nation. We must do this demantle, dismantling through nonviolent struggle. We must eventually convince still millions and millions of people. It's the way the nation has been taken in the last few years, especially our international major domestic policies are wrong and must be corrected. So I pledge myself to that continuing work of justice and peace that ICUGAP represents. I'd like to commend the choice of ICUJP for the Regus Award this year to Congresswoman Judy Chu. She's been throughout the last 20 or 30 years a, um, a, in, an elected official in full harmony with the meaning of ICUJP. In, a, in, in her own work, in the things that she has tried to support and continue to support. So I'm delighted that ICUJP is honoring her with the Regus Courageous Award uh, and, and hope that this helps us continue to cement the work we've done over the last 20 years. Thank you very much. Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, ICUJP has for over a decade followed a clear vision to organize communities of faith and conscience in support of peace, justice, and human dignity in the face of war and intolerance, compelling religious communities across the country to stop blessing war and violence by speaking truth to power, to whomever is in power. and big business yeah. to direct us away from peace to war, away from brotherhood and sisterhood to chaos. So, we are here declaring that we will remain here and be here for the struggle until indeed we can point this country away from what it is doing to what it needs to do on behalf of all people. So I say to you, we must resist, but we must also organize our families, organize our friends, organize our congregations, organize our neighborhoods, teach them, help them to understand that this is the beginning of a protracted, nonviolent struggle until indeed we change governments as they are to make them what governments ought to be in America. That's our task. So, war and violence, we must stop blessing. We must instead use our resources to bless one another and to bless truth and peace and wonder and the infinite possibilities of this century. Every day that we stay at war is another day of loss and tragedy that we cannot afford. Not in our hearts, not in our spirits, not in our federal budget. Every day is too long. Where have we been? Where are we now? What is the vision of the future that we long to create? Every day during Elul, we hear the sounds of the shofar, the ram's horn. May these sounds remind us of all of those whose lives were lost on the attacks on 9-11 and also in the wars that emerged in response to those attacks, both soldiers and civilians. May these sounds challenge us to ask what we have done over these years to bring healing to our world. 
And may these sounds empower us to work together for peace. for the wars and 41% of our children live in poverty in the United States of America. That is the greatest obscenity of our day. We say make jobs not war, make sense not war, make art not war, make anything not war. We're connecting the greed on Wall Street with the greed of war profiteers. And that peace power is the power that will work through us and work through everyone we come in contact with once we understand it's first within ourselves. When you dehumanize a whole race of people, a whole religion of people, a whole area of the world, just because they're brown, that you can treat them like they're not human, treat them that like they don't exist, that this is somehow justified. But this is not just about my community of faith. It's not about my community of faith that's being affected by all of this. It's about my community of conscience. And we are called, all of us, to a different vision of the world, a vision in which the essential dignity and humaneness of every human being, whoever they may be, every human being is honored. We in the field of religion call that being made in the image of God, the divine essence of every human being. I want to urge that we put aside all the political fancies about these days and instead we unite around the notion that we must get in the way of the forces of spiritual wickedness that will reduce this country to an oligarchy and end the experience of self-government towards the destiny of every man and every woman. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We will walk in peace. We shall not be moved. We are honored to have a very special guest who was able to join us on short notice. Lowry Smith is the stepson of the Reverend George Regus, and he'll share a few words of reflection with us. I wish I had George's ability to memorize everything like he did, but not even close. Um, 44 years ago, my mom and George got married, and uh, I knew he was a priest, but you know, it wasn't the Catholic Church at that time kind of scared me because I was already, uh, a lot of my cousins were already going to uh, the Catholic schools. So everything was fine until our first family vacation, which happened to be the sabbatical. So a year after George came into our lives, we did a 20 country stop around the world, which I thought were hot spots, meant neat places to go, but it was war zones. So the first month was in South Africa and we met with 28 different people, including Boothalese and Tutu, um, a lot of really dangerous meetings with the National Party, and they would bring us along. So the first month was in South Africa, then we got to spend a month in Jerusalem and got to go to an, a school there. And then we spent the other majority of time in Egypt and lots of other places along the way. I still thought things were okay. And uh, I understood that George would support me as a father, which he, he did and our age difference at 35 years, 
allowed us to interact on a different level. And what he was doing, I think, then was what is now this, because we went everywhere and we were really finding humanity. And I think that's the biggest thing to take away from George is equality through humanity and humanity through equality. And that's what George and I talked about a lot the last year of his life <clears throat> as I tried to get through his mind and, and find different things and that simplistic thing, <clears throat> all of the different differences that we were cut up was all getting back to humanity. And it's appropriate that he has this award, so thank you. Um, other than that, he was just as uh, enthusiastic about playing basketball as he was about uh, studying for the sermon, which got to the point where if I got home too late on a Saturday night, he, by 2 o'clock in the morning, was working on a sermon for Sunday. So don't stop. Don't ever stop pushing for justice, equality, and ultimately humanity. Thank you. obscenity imaginable. The U.S. has spent more than four trillion dollars on these wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, and we will spend trillions more with the wounded that come home, the servicemen and servicewomen. Forty percent of the soldiers come home wounded. Well, George, uh has been faithful for a very long time in the prophetic sense, in the sense of being uh, a voice that truly does speak truth to power. Four trillion dollars for the wars and 41 percent of our children live in poverty in the United States of America. That's the greatest obscenity I can imagine. Thank you. I'm Rabbi Stephen Jacobs, and I'm here as just one of a number of people in the interreligious community who has come to honor Reverend Dr. George Regas for his uniqueness, his courage in speaking out against war. He has been one of the most significant voices in the country in a leadership position. So many out of work, so many losing their homes and the rich get richer and so many remain poor and God weeps God weeps at what God's children are doing and those of you who know George and me know that we met one another in 1967 at a rally in Exposition Park protesting the war in Vietnam. It was a raucous, rowdy, motley gathering. It had none of the refinement that you might think would fit well with a rector from a distinguished church in Pasadena wearing his clergy collar or a Bella rabbi in his button-down white shirt. As I listened to him that day, I was awed by the enormous power of his words and by his great moral passion. And I loved the way that his body moved as he spoke and the soft accents of Knoxville, which are still today in his voice. 
That's where it all began. And it deepened and deepened and brought us to be together as we walked on the same path, the path that leads toward the achievement of justice and peace. And so one thing that I have decided to do and 14 others are joining me is to commit an act of civil disobedience to allow ourselves to be arrested just as a symbol of how deeply we feel about peace and how much we oppose the war. All the resources of this great country that could heal are used to destroy. I hate war for that. And so we're going to be arrested, a small symbol of how deeply committed we are to bring peace to this world. Thank you. We shall overcome someday. Uh, history serves us well. I believe that the nonviolent revolution is actually taking place right before our eyes. Our troops are at home. And I hope that we can all be in the mode of saying and exercising a prophetic utterance that we will study war no more. Uh, friends, again, I would like to introduce another person, uh, Rachel Wobie, the Arts Director of Mosquite. She will join us via video from the All Saints Sanctuary. Uh, Rachel is a conductor and educator renowned for reimagining the traditional concert format and for dissolving the barriers between performers and audiences. She is founder and artistic director of Muskeek, a member supported nonprofit organization that makes engaging life music experiences accessible for all. I present to you Rachel Wobey. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. There's a wonderful Yiddish word, beshert. Actually, people use it often to mean soulmate, but the real literal definition is destiny. Beshert. George Regas, Rachel Warby. We were beshert, meant to be, meant to meet. When I first came to Pasadena, George Regas was person I met within one week of being here. He asked me, where are you from originally? When I told him that I was born on High Avenue in Nyack, New York, he looked at me and said, I had a feeling we had known each other from before, because of course, before he came here to All Saints, he was in a wonderful church in Nyack, New York, only one block away from where I was born. So we both came here from the same small town in New York. When George Regas used to speak, he often quoted Sophocles, but I have a feeling that he would forgive us today if we wanted to quote a little bit of Paul McCartney. All my life, you were only waiting for this moment to arise. And that's because Paul McCartney wrote this song in honor of the civil rights workers working in Little Rock for educational equality, something that was so near and dear to George Rikas's heart. Please join me in welcoming Keita Matsuna and Kenton Chen.
ICUJP was formed in response to 9-11. We were troubled and profoundly saddened by the cries for retaliation. Yes, some response to that vicious attack was important, but not the devastation of war. We felt 9-11 demanded the work of justice. We disavowed the path that said our grief must lead to war. We refused to accept violence as the necessary consequence of our tragic loss. And over these 10 years, two positions have been dominant for ICUJP. One, religious communities must stop blessing war and violence. And two, recognizing the war system is deeply embedded in America. Nevertheless, we affirm our membership in one human family. And we have proclaimed over these 10 years that the sin, the evil, of these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq is the belief that an American child is more precious and sacred than an Iraqi child. America's enormous resources of wealth and technology should be used for health and education and peacemaking, not for the wars of destruction in the building of an empire. Let us continue to be resolute in our work for peace and justice. So may the Great Spirit bless you and keep you. Make his and her face to shine upon you. Lift up their light upon you and grant you peace and joy this day and until the end of time. Amen. Amen. Father Regas and Rabbi General Berman are the, my soul mates, really. They are my twin brothers, uh, both spiritually and intellectually. And uh, our getting together was, uh, I consider it, I see the hands of God in woving such uh, abundant uh, together to become more effective. Father Regas, I, I knew him when he talked in a conference, and I was uh, just curious to see what this father will say. And I liked very much uh, what he said and the way I sensed sincerity. Rabbi Berman, I, uh, I was in a bookstore. Uh, the Midnight Special Bookstore, uh, which was such an important uh, place uh, in the lives of progressives in, for many, many years. And I was invited for a discussion and the discussion was about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Where Dr. Hatut and I discovered that we were brothers. And I was outspoken, which made uh, lots of people there angry, talking back and forth in, 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 not, a, not in a very amicable way. And uh, out of our separate religious tradition, we were at one with one another. 
while I was really under, under fire. And I was talking about the cruelty of the Israeli government in crushing the Palestinian movement. And one of the women there was very angry about that. And I found this voice coming from behind me and saying, telling her, lady, are you denying that the Israeli forces are very cruel in dealing with the Palestinians? And I said, my God, here is the, the voice of Moses. I looked behind me, and this was Rabbi Berman. I never saw him before. But I never lost sight of him since then. We became very close, and um, I enjoy this friendship very much. What I've said before, which I think lies at the heart of Christianity, Judaism and Christianity, and Islam, and that is the sacredness of human life, something divine, and something that brings with it a dimension of obligation that has no ending, and insistence that human beings are really here to love one another, to care for one another, and to live peacefully uh, and fulfill themselves. Uh, as human beings, as children of God in that way. Interfaith communities united for justice and peace because it's inclusive, it's all of us together. And uh, so we've been at it for 20 years and um, thought we would never have to be here for 20 years. We literally thought that it might be a year or two and our country would wake up but here we are, and we saw the results uh, in just the last few weeks of the war in Afghanistan. War does not bring peace, and it certainly doesn't bring justice. Uh, in 2011, we had been together for 10 years, and ICUJP decided on its 10th anniversary that we would recognize the visionary leadership of Reverend Dr. George Regas. And so we established the George F. Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award. This award honors individuals and organizations who have, ex who have exemplified this passionate commitment that religious communities must stop blessing war and violence. And of course, guess who got the very first award? Reverend George Regas. <laughs> we gave it to him as a sign of the love and appreciation that we had, and indeed, the entire peace and justice com community has towards this singular man in Los Angeles who had the foresight to convene us and to build this into a powerful voice supporting peace and justice over the years. Since then, we have had the privilege of giving it to Reverend James Lawson, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, Dr. Maher Atut, and you've all seen them, and also a host of others, e Aisha Mason, the Reverend Chip Murray, Rabbi Ken Jake Chasen, Reverend Francisco Garcia, Edina Lekovic, Sister Pat Cromer, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Jewish Voice for Peace and World Beyond War. These are organizations and individuals who have been courageous in standing for the principles that ICUJP stands for. Today, it is my honor to introduce our first awardee today, which is Representative Judy Chu. Judy Chu made history in, in 2009 as being the very first Chinese American that was elected to Congress. And she represents our district here, the 27th district, which happens to be my district and the district of this church. She serves on many powerful com uh, committees in the Senate, and you can read a lot more about it in the program. She's a resident of Monterey Park, and we honor her for her consistent advocacy on behalf of the marginalized and oppressed, 
even risking her own life to protest and bring attention to inhumane and discrimin discriminatory policies. ICUJP is really grateful for her ongoing support of immigrants. Believing our immigration system is in need of reform, she worked to pass H.R. 15, the Border Security, Economic Opportunity, and Immigration Modernization Act. In July, in July of 2015, Representative Chu spoke out before Congress against what she called the shocking treatment of women and children held in for-profit U.S. detention facilities. Comparing them to Japanese American incarceration camps, she said the prolonged detention re-traumatized families, breaks apart the parent-child relationship, and Representative Chu was even supporting the DREAM Act, at the time not a very popular uh, stance. She has been incredibly courageous in that stand and even was arrested at the U.S. Capitol protest once. Uh, Representative Chu has welcomed us many times as we've gone to her office to advocate for different policies that we want pushed in our government. But we today are really recognizing her because she became one of the 24 congressional co-sponsors of H.R. 2590. Oh, you don't forget that number. The Defending the Human Rights of Palestinian Children and Families Living Under Israeli Military Occupation. This bill prohibits U.S. military aid to Israel from being used to demolish homes, annex Palestinian land, or imprison Palestinian children in military detention facilities. ICUJP stands firmly with her in support of that. George Rigas, our dearly beloved co-founder and convener, admonished us all to advocate for children everywhere. He said, an American child is no better than an Iraqi child. Representative Chu supports the fundamental rights of children worldwide to live in peace, secure from fear of war and violence, and for this, we honor her with the 2021 George F. Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award. Representative Chu will come on. Hello, and thank you so much for honoring me with the George F. Regas Courageous Peacemaker Award. It means so much to be recognized by such an incredible organization, and that is why I am so grateful for the opportunity to join with Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace to help celebrate your 20th anniversary. For two decades now, you have been such an important voice in urging religious communities to help stop war, gun violence, hate, and so many more ills that put lives at risk. I especially want to thank you for speaking out in support of the Stop Asian Hate Movement over the past year. This support means so much to me, as I know it does to Asian Americans across the country. That is why I believe that we also need to be using our voices on behalf of all marginalized communities. And right now, some of the most vulnerable people are the Palestinians living under occupation in the West Bank. For far too long, the needs of Palestinians were ignored or dismissed. That is why I have made it a priority to better understand the situation there and to push for solutions that will end the unacceptable status quo and create the conditions for peace. You see, when I was first elected to Congress, I was invited on a trip to Israel with many of my new colleagues. I learned a lot on this trip, but it mostly focused on Israel's security issues. We barely saw the occupied territories, and the only Palestinian perspectives we heard were those who spoke about living in Israel, not those living under the occupation. It was only in 2019 when I went back with another group, J Street, that we went to the West Bank and really explored what the occupation means. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. You cannot understand Israel without also understanding the occupation. You cannot understand Israel unless you understand both the Israeli and Palestinian point of view. 
And that is why I appreciate it the many times that we talked in depth with not just regular Israeli citizens, but regular Palestinians as well. On this trip, I learned about the array of restrictions that Israel had placed on Palestinians and the West Bank. I learned about how the West Bank has been divided with Palestinians only able to govern a small portion of the land, while the most desired land, about 60% of the West Bank, is controlled by Israel. I also saw what that division looks like, with Palestinians forced to drive on completely different roads and held up for hours at checkpoints just to get into Israel, even if it's for work or medical care. And I heard stories of Palestinians being harassed by Israeli soldiers just for fun. Worse, I saw how deliberate all of this was. The settlement policy was not a haphazard process led by fanatics. These are often planned communities, often lush suburbs that are being used to carve up the West Bank so a future Palestinian state is impossible. And the harassment of Palestinian families was actually a tactic adopted by the military to, as they put it, make their presence felt. This means randomly choosing Palestinian homes to search in the middle of the night. And because this is a military occupation as opposed to the evictions in places like East Jerusalem, that means no warrants, no approval from a judge, and little respect for the families being harassed and violated. It took me going to Israel and actually hearing from those most impacted by the occupation to fully understand the injustice of the occupation and why we must end it. This isn't just for the benefit of the Palestinians. This is the only way to secure the peaceful future of a Jewish and democratic Israel. Because if Israel wants to hold on to the West Bank, it will either have to stop being a democracy or become a Jewish apartheid state. And neither option is acceptable. That is why one of my top priorities when it comes to this conflict is opposing anything that furthers annexation or makes a future two-state solution harder to achieve. For instance, A few years ago, the Israeli government was preparing to destroy the Palestinian village of Susia. Hundreds would have lost their homes, but at the last minute, the evacuation was canceled. Why? Because advocates like you and members of Congress were willing to speak out. I was one of 70 members who signed a letter condemning it, and I believe the change in plans shows that American opposition can still be instrumental in shaping Israel's policies. And so last summer, when I was informed that another Palestinian family, the Sumerans, were set to be forced from their home in East Jerusalem, I knew that I had to speak out. I joined a letter by Representative Jackie Spear of California opposing not only this eviction, but all of the planned evictions in a neighborhood in Sheikh Jarrah. Sadly, since this was a judicial process, it was harder to stop, and our letter failed to have the same impact on Israel's policy. As a result, Israel planned to move ahead with the forced evacuations in Sheikh Jarrah, and it led to the tragic war with Hamas, in which too many innocent Israelis and Palestinians were forced to pay the price. This cycle of violence of Hamas attacking Israel Israel responding, and innocent Palestinians paying the price has gone on for far too many years. That is why I immediately called for a ceasefire, the only sure way to stop the bloodshed on both sides. And I was relieved that with the leadership of President Biden, the violence stopped after 11 long days. This war also made clear that unless we take action to bring both sides closer to peace, the cycle of violence will continue. And I think one of the most effective ways we can do that is to look at the way aid to Israel is used. Now, for the most part, I support this aid because it helps Israel maintain a balance with its neighbors. And we saw in the most recent war that the Iron Dome successfully saved lives from Hamas rockets. But I've also seen the way Israel's military 
behavior in the occupied territories, especially toward Palestinian minors, can hurt. And that is not what our aid dollars are meant for. That is why I think it's time for transparency, accountability, and oversight into our aid to Israel. I want to make sure that the money we send to Israel is only used for the purposes we intended, not to further annex or violate the rights of Palestinians. That is why I am a co-sponsor of Representative McCollum's bill, H.R. 2590, which would require this type of reporting so we could better understand how our aid is used. And we've told some who are concerned about this bill that this should be a good thing for Israel. If we can show that the U.S. taxpayer is not supporting things like annexation or a military occupation, that should give people confidence in how the aid is being used. If the report shows that the U.S. taxpayer dollars are being used in this way that violates our laws, then this report will be instrumental in fixing this problem by shining a light on it. So thank you again for honoring me today and for being a model of interfaith cooperation that can help bring people together in peace. On this sacred day, a day seared into the hearts and minds of everyone old enough to remember 9-11. Appropriately, we honor the amazing leadership of George Regas and all of you who are honored today as you gather at All Saints. I cannot be with you as I'm traveling up and down California speaking at recall rallies uh, with my wife, Betty Yi, the controller of the great state of California. Um, as we meet with people all over, we will then join with President Joseph Biden on uh, Monday uh, in Long Beach as he speaks out and supports the leadership of Gavin New Newsom and the leadership, uh, the democratic leadership of our state of California. I miss being with you physically, but George would tell me if I had a problem about coming to All Saints today, he would say, Stephen, you go out in the streets and protest against those who would tear apart our government and its leadership. So George speaks to us, to me, even as he's no longer with us physically. The psychiatrist once wrote that when all is said and done, the only thing that we have that is truly ours are our memories. And each of us carries significant, powerful memories as we reflect on this awesome day. 20 years ago, George Regas and I met at 5 a.m. at LAX to board an American Airlines flight to New York to join others in an interfaith conference. We were shut down. We were not able to move from where we were for hours and hours as they thought that perhaps another plane would fly into LA. Those of you who remember that day, remember what it was like and George and I were together. And then two weeks later, we were part of a group of clergy that were invited to join the grieving families at the site of World Center. And we gathered with hundreds and hundreds of grieving families. It was beyond description as we sat there. And it was tender and it was beautiful until one man, Reverend Franklin Graham, stood up and blamed the Muslims and gave voice to Islamophobia that became the byword in America from his disastrous words. We were left in shock, in shock from Reverend Graham's assertion that Muslims were to blame. When we left that memorial service, George's vision was to create a movement, to create an organization 
ICU JP as a beacon of hope to lead in this creation of ICU JP to strengthen solidarity and friendship between Muslims and pe peace loving Muslims and peace um, activists and other spiritual traditions in greater Los Angeles. That was his vision and that's why all of you, all of us honor him and the work uh, that each of you and your organizations do. I want to conclude by sharing something that's in my mind all the time. I have a friend who lived in an apartment building very close to the World Center. And when all settled down, the dust and the ashes were on his windowsill. And he said that he could not clean them off. He gathered them up, thinking perhaps that on his windowsill were the ashes of a body from that day of 9-11. And he took the ashes and he buried them traditionally. What a sacred way that we have of restoring life after death. And now to honor you in so many sacred ways, I'm sending loving thoughts and great appreciation for the work that you do now, the work that is needed day in and day out. God bless you and thank you. For decades unto generations, this congregation has lived out the wonderful truth that whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on your journey of faith, there is a place for you here. There are new generations that are right now singing God's freedom songs with their lips and with their lives. And they are young, and they are black, and brown, and queer, and profane, and we get to go out and meet them out there where they are. And we get to let them teach us and lead us in their song. Hallelujah. 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 We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And that means that our first thing is God and that we are a part of God's epic love story that transcends time and space. I invite you to look in your heart and to hear the voice of Jesus and try, just try to trust that it's true that Jesus loves you as you are for who you are. Slavery is when some of God's children go to schools with high-tech science labs and college counselors and others go to school with metal detectors and disciplinary officers. Slavery is when some of God's children shop in stores with beautiful produce sections and others are greeted by huge liquor counters. Slavery is when a little girl can't stay awake in school because every night she wakes up screaming thinking immigration is coming to take her mother away. Slavery is when Dylan Roof and his smoking gun gets a trip to Burger King and Tamir Rice and his toy gun gets a trip to the morgue. As a Christian, as a priest and pastor, I am righteously indignant at what is happening in our nation, not in spite of being a follower of Jesus, but because I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't think we can do justice unless we protect our hope. You have to be hopeful. You have to believe things you haven't seen. You have to be guided by a fundamental hopelessness. Hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Working with somebody, they're homeless, uh, often on the streets, perhaps in a shelter, maybe in some sort of emergency hotel program. That's what gets me out of bed every day, is knowing that I have the privilege to help give a voice to people that are disregarded, to people that are overlooked. We, we look around the city of Los Angeles and there's tons of encampments and it doesn't look pretty. It's not a nice sight. So people drive by and, and disregard them. My name is Bismarck Ellis. I am 53 years old. How long have you been working? Well, this last episode, it's been eight years. I've been covering someone from Housing Works about 
six months ago. Um, I was referred to Housing Works, and I met one of your staff members, and here I am today. I met her, we got along right off the top. A little complicated with this coronavirus thing going on, but she told me that Housing Works would work on getting me some permanent housing, you know, for either low income or Section 8 or things like that. And she was the one to help me do that and find a decent place to live. In the last six months, which has really been a short time, actually, I finally got a Section 8 voucher and we're looking at apartment units right now in the last few weeks. What we do is we identify individuals who are the most vulnerable living on the streets and we get them off the streets and into housing. So once we house them, we become their advocates. Attacking Palestinians, that's okay. Israeli lives matter. Palestinian lives don't matter. That is the message I got. And that is the message all people of faith who are standing for human rights and justice and for the Palestinians' rights to dignity, to living and practicing their faith like all other faiths. And it's time that we start listening, as we've been saying, that the Palestinian people are human beings too. Thank God for the voices that are speaking out. Thank God for the Jewish and Israeli voices that are speaking out against this injustice against the Palestinians. And as a Christian, I remind you that Christians in Palestine are also standing with their Palestinian Muslim brothers and sisters and saying, we are for justice and peace. When the Israeli military and police act the way they do to Palestinians, treating them as less than human, treating them with indignity, treating them as things. And there is nothing civil about Jews claiming the rights to the entire land and displacing holy human beings from their homes that they've lived in for generations. We're unified on the principles of justice. We're unified on the principles of religious freedom. We're unified on the principle that the people will force change because the governments are failing in affecting positive change to develop a resolution. New ground is pluralism, plain and simple. 
a place where people can really have an authentic voice, stay true to themselves, stay true to their community and their own beliefs, and still respect other people. You approach this situation through steps. The first stage is like building your relationship with the people who are in this particular group. And that right there helped build you towards the bigger conversations. I realized that when I am around someone who's Jewish, I used to get this feeling in the pit of my stomach, this preemptive like, oh, we are supposed to not like each other. I thought I was an unbiased person going into this. Keeping your mouth shut and not talking poorly about someone doesn't mean that you're, you don't hold bias. After going through the program, I realized I wasn't as understanding of the other side as I thought I was. Newground had such an innovative approach and really takes the time to build relationships before you touch on really hard issues. They're engaging in an eight, nine month process and the fact that we don't start the conversations with those points of disagreement, but we actually build people's skills up, build their investment in each other, help them understand how to disagree, that conflict is a natural, inevitable, and healthy part of those relationships. Uh, we're honored to name our first group of organizations as the Reverend George F. Rigas Courageous Peacemakers. All Saints Episcopal Church. Okay. Housing Works. Intellect, Love, Mercy Foundation. <laughs> Emmanuel Presbyterian Food Distribution Center. <laughs> Muslim Public Affairs Council. New Ground, a Muslim-Jewish partnership for change. I was actually just sitting here thinking that um, what a wonderful place to be to commemorate, you know, the, the day that today of justice sometimes is slow and person to person. And uh, we are just grateful for, for this honor today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Intellect, Love, uh, and Mercy Foundation, uh, Omar Tahim. Thank you, man. I got it. How you doing? Good. Wait, no, 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 no. How you doing? Good. When I say I see you, you say JP, I see you. JP. I see you. JP. No justice? No justice? No peace. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, I'm very thankful on behalf of the Intellect, Love, and Mercy Foundation and on behalf of Imam Sadiq and Khalil Jr., Naeem Shah, and Hanafi Shakur for accepting this reward. We are totally thankful and grateful to the board members, to the staff, to the members, to the community, to ICU, JP, for, for giving us this situation and really thankful. Um, real briefly, I remember I see you, JP, as that organization holding the conversations that nobody was holding at the time. They pushed the envelope all the time on the front line. So it is an honor for the Intellect, Love, and Mercy Foundation, Imam Sadiq, and the founders of the M Foundation to receive this award because we have to hold the line. We know what brought us together, but what's going to keep us together to do the work? Thank you. Uh, 
uh, Emmanuel Presbyterian Food Distribution Center, Nambu Renan. I don't think, I think she had to go. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, Salam al Mariati. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 20 years ago, on this day, Dr. Marhatut, God rest his soul, and myself were on the way to the White House. Uh, along with 10 other Muslim political organizations to meet with the president at the time and get a Muslim appointed to the White House. Uh, after 9-11, uh, of course, everything changed. And the next day, we were worried about whether there were going to be internment camps or not. But it was voices like ICUJP, All Saints Church, Leo Beck Temple, First United Methodist Church, the leadership of George Regas, Leonard Bierman, Jim Lawson, and others that prevented another nightmare of internment from happening again. So I'm indebted, we are indebted to you in partnership, not only in protecting a community from internment, but protecting America from another dangerous era and, and, and striking uh, against American values. So in preserving American values, doing the right thing, in that prophetic, prophetic voice, no matter how long it takes, it is a multi-generational campaign. It is ICUJP that has that voice. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now uh, New Ground, a Muslim-Jewish partnership for change. Paul Beck. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Beck. I'm a member of the board of New Ground, a Muslim-Jewish partnership for change. I'm also a member of Leo Beck Temple, and I feel like I stand among giants today. New Ground is an interesting organization that has taken on the task of trying to enable people to have different stories, but they're coexisting, to understand that these narratives that people have, their lives, their stories, are both true. They may be in conflict, and conflict may be inevitable, but it's not intractable. There are ways in which people can engage, listen, and empower each other. That's what Newground is about. Newground was founded about 14 years ago, and I'm particularly honored and humbled to be here with Salam, as well as Umar, because Salam and uh, the Muslim Public Affairs Council and Ben the Ark created what became Newground. Newground launched its own independence several years later, but we continue to rest on the strength of those relationships. And uh, the inspiration came from ICUJP, specifically from, Re from Reverend Regas, Mayor Hatut, and Leonard Bierman back in 2013 when they were honored. They were always providing us counsel, compassion, calling us out when we wanted to try things we'd already failed at. Particularly want to thank ICUJP for its persistence and courageous leadership and willingness to uphold and be a model for engaging across difference I've never seen a world that was so polarized as what we have right now. So even though conflict is natural and inevitable, no matter the history, it's a choice to be stuck and not to be able to move forward. We build relationships between Muslims and Jews so that they can transform their communities through a lasting partnership. So New Ground transforms communities through the power of creating relationships. I know I speak for Aziza Hassan, our incredible executive director, and our entire board in thanking you again for this honor and for leading the way and enabling us to do the work that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Rachel Warby will perform for us. 
19 years ago today, George Rigas was of tremendous assistance to me when I, as one of hundreds of conductors around the world, made the commitment to perform Mozart's Requiem at 8.26 a.m. 200 orchestras all around the globe made that commitment so that there would be a Mozart Requiem heard at 8.26 a.m. in every single time zone. When I needed a place to house musicians, to allow people to change into performance costumes and to use restrooms, it was George Regas who stood up and said, come to All Saints. So George, this is for you. In the book of Exodus, we learn that God said to Moses, go to the Pharaoh and grab the Israelites away from that Pharaoh. That story got turned into a spiritual because the enslaved African Americans who came to this country brought with them two treasures, the art of singing and a love of storytelling. The story and song, Go Down Moses, was one which resonated with them deeply. Reverend Otis Moss once said, never confuse position with power. George Wallace had the position, but Rosa Parks had the power. Lyndon Baines Johnson had the position, but Martin Luther King had the power. The Pharaoh had the position, but it was Moses who had the power. Go down Moses with music's wonderful musicians, Ashley Fatolia and Alan Steinberger. And now there's a, a second uh, group uh, that's been awarded the George F. Rigas Courageous Peacemaker Award. So we will now honor uh, the second group. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. <laughs> because 
because it's obstructing voting rights. Not just because it's obstructing the possibility of people having a better wage, which is the 15 minimum wage, but it's also obstructing the possibility of us thinking about a future where everybody can have access to health care, where housing becomes a human right, where access to water is something that is real. Turn my side, turn me around, we're gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. For over 75 years, the Friends Committee on National Legislation has been a driving force for powerful, nonpartisan policy change in Washington. But we know that lasting change doesn't start in Washington, D.C. It comes from ordinary people around the country who speak truth to power. That's why FCNL supports a network of over 120 grassroots advocacy teams around the country. These teams develop long-term relationships with their members of Congress and their staff to drive change in federal policy. Two years ago, when we were considering our strategy to end endless wars, we thought of not even trying to lobby our conservative representative, but focus instead on our Democratic senator we thought would be easier. But then we said, no, if we really believe that there is that of God in everyone, we need to try, we need to engage. Well, he became a co-sponsor of the legislation we were asking him to support. So working with the advocacy teams has really taught us to expand our horizons and find common ground with others. Advocacy teams receive in-depth training and regular support from FCNL staff to learn how they can be most effective. They meet with members of Congress, publish in the media, and organize community events to build support around one legislative campaign each year. These grassroots advocates come from a range of backgrounds and faith traditions, but their efforts are rooted in Quaker traditions like deep listening, connecting across shared values, and speaking to that of God in each person, especially when we disagree.
heard from our corner of the uh, faith community with the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Um, faith leaders across the United States and uh, internationally today are, I'm sure, uh, lifting up prayers for those whose lives have been permanently damaged by this torture chamber in Guantanamo. Faith leaders have from day one implored this president and the State Department to live up to their professed claim and their public words that closing Guantanamo would be a top priority for this administration. And the release of 20 de 28 detainees in 2014, many at the end of last year, we're thankful for that. I can't even call it a good start. It's not good enough. And it hasn't been good enough for a while. I'm reminded of the cry of the psalmist in Psalms 13. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? Uh, I will also uh, invite uh, two persons who are here, and that is uh, Colleen Thomas from the Poor People's Campaign. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, uh, ICUJP. It's an honor to be here. Oh, yes. I am representing the Poor People's Campaign. Um, we're a national campaign and also local here in California. And um, it's an honor to be uh, here and also partnering with ICUJP now in recent days. Um, we have a common vision um, and a common hope. It's, and for PPC, our, our work is grounded in our deepest beliefs and constitutional values. Um, we're guided by our morality to uphold the dignity of all people. The PPC National Call for Moral Revival acknowledges the interlocking injustices of systematic racism, poverty, militarism in the war economy, ecological devastation, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. Um, there are 140 million poor and low wealth people in our country and 250,000 people die a year from poverty alone. Um, so it goes without saying here that our war economy and militarism um, deny the most vulnerable access to programs and resources and um, our investment in a culture of war versus a culture of care uh, does need to end. Um, we do hope that we can continue in this work and continue partnering with ICUJP um, to continue to fight poverty and not fight the poor. Thanks. Good afternoon and greetings from Sonoma County. It is with deep humility and much gratitude that I humbly accept this generous award with our co-coordinator, Robert Baer, on behalf of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, California Statewide Advocacy Team. For over 76 years, FCNL has been lobbying, and in the past 18 months lobbying over Zoom, to help bring the beloved community into form through a focus on ending war, equity and justice, economic justice, and the environment. Quaker values see that of God in everyone, and FCNL excels in bipartisan and respectful lobbying. There are currently 125 local advocacy teams across 44 states and DC. California has 11 teams, and we gather as a statewide group to share information about our congressional districts and to lobby our senators together. Our current geographic range extends from Sacramento to San Diego and from the ocean to the valley. With the possibility of two more teams being added up north, we could grow to 13 teams in up to 24 districts. Our LA team sends their specific greetings and would love to continue our collaboration and welcome you as part of their team. We thank you very much for your partnership and recognition in our common work to create a better world for all.
Thank you. Hello, I'm Reverend Gary Bernard Williams, and I'm one of the co-chairs of Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice. And I'm Mary Stancavage. I'm the other co-chair of CLU. And congratulations to ICUJP on your 20th anniversary. On behalf of CLU's staff and board, we want to thank you for this awesome recognition of our work. Both of our organizations are seeking peace and justice in these turbulent times. We both mobilize justice-seeking people of faith to take action on issues of peace and justice, equity and fairness. Our faith calls us to work together to build a more justice-filled society. We celebrate with you today and look forward to finding new ways to collaborate in the near future. Thank you, Gary. Um, Clue and ICUJP share very similar roots. Clue was founded in the mid-90s when workers in Los Angeles were fighting for economic justice and a living wage. Reverend Lawson, Reverend Regas, Rabbi Bierman, and others saw the need for religious leaders of all faiths to take up the fight for a just and equitable society, and we're still at it. For over 25 years, Clue has brought together faith communities, led coalitions, and supported unions to improve the lives of low-wage workers, immigrants, and communities of color. When the pandemic hit, we met this extraordinary challenge head on and are still at it today. After 9-11, many of those great minds who helped to found Clue brought the same wisdom and sense of moral responsibility to found ICUJP, working for justice and peace. We are so honored to be your cousin, and we look forward to the day when we have outlived our purpose. Congratulations, ICUJP. Good afternoon, my name is Pastor Q, pastor of the Church with Our Walls, Skid Row. I'm also a faith-rooted organizer with CLU, that is Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice. CLU is one of the organizations which helps to organize the BJJA in partnership with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, along with Ben Ark and some others. I would like to thank the ICUJP for granting the Courageous Peacemaker Award to the BJJA. And though we could not be there today to accept the award, we certainly resonate with the mission of ICUJP, and that is that religious communities must stop blessing war and violence. Thus, I accept the award on behalf of every member of the BJJA. We would like to thank you for this award. God bless you. On behalf of St. Mark's Lutheran Church, thank you for this award. In the holy scriptures of my faith community, the word apocalypse means a great unveiling. Things that were hidden come to light. And this COVID season has been an apocalypse in that scriptural sense, a great unveiling that helped us see things more clearly. St. Mark's has been doing peace and justice work for 117 years, but over this last year, I was amazed to see how the Spirit stirred up new movements for peace and justice among us. And usually this happened through new partnerships and renewed relationships. We're so grateful for the partnership of so many, from our North Area Neighborhood Council to our, our council office in District 8 to Dignity Health and the Hope Street Family Center, and especially today to you at ICUJP and our dear friends in the Sola Community Peace Center. We are grateful for all those working for peace and justice in these days. Yes, COVID-19 has brought us so much grief and pain, but it did teach us some important things. The need to be adaptive and flexible as we lived our commitments to justice and peace coupled with the value of collaborations and partnerships such as SOLAs with St. Mark's, ICJP, and USC. While we had done our peace programs for years prior to COVID, it had all been in person or on location. The challenges of taking all our peace programs online while helping meet the needs of the families we serve wouldn't have been possible without our strong partnerships and SOLA board. In closing, our young people at SOLA tell us that one of the things they most appreciate from us is the safe space and community we create together. 
William Baldwin said that a community is a group of people who have come together and they work and they live to try and improve the standard of living and quality of life. I treasure the beloved community we are co-creating with our solo young people, their families and our partners. Many thanks for honoring this work. I see you, JP. I'm delighted to accept this award on behalf of the National Network of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And my sincerest thanks really go to each and every one of you at Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, for you have been an instrumental part of this 20-year journey with NearCat to end the U.S.-sponsored torture that resulted from the disastrous response of the U.S. government and military to the events on 9-11 unbelievably, 20 years ago. I feel particularly honored to receive an award named after Reverend George Regas. I was in Los Angeles and marched side by side with George and some of you in the March Against the War in Iraq as part of the February 2003 coordinated days of protest across the world. Millions of people in more than 600 cities joined together, stood up, and tried to stop the U.S. and its allies from responding to 9-11 with war rather than diplomacy and global cooperation. Today on 9-11, my heart goes out to the 9-11 families, most of whom wanted answers, not a torture program conducted in their name. My heart goes out to the families of the over 7,000 U.S. troops who died in Afghanistan and Iraq fighting futile wars. My heart goes out to the families of the over 30,000 U.S. veterans of these two wars who have committed suicide since coming home. And of course, we can never forget the torture victims and the tens and hundreds of thousands who have died in other countries while the so-called war on tor terror has raged on. As a faith community, we've stood up for peace and we will continue to stand up for peace. We're not going anywhere at NearCat until we win and I know you won't either. Blessings to all of you and keep up the good work. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Fernando Fernando. And I am Ker Francis Lycan. I, I see you, JP. I see you, JP. We'd like to welcome all of you to our next ICU JP event on November 7th at 4 p.m. We will meet virtually to plan a major action against systemic racism. We propose creating an ongoing workshop, a work a network to cohere a critical mass of faith-based groups and community organizations able to take concrete action towards achieving the full spectrum of racial justice issues. Dynamic justice where everyone has a chance, a decent income, Security justice, where black lives matter in policing. Criminal justice, where court are fair. Medical justice, where all can attain quality health care. Housing justice, where no one red line, is redlined out of housing. Environmental justice, where indigenous reservations and urban communities are sustainable. Civic justice, where voting rights are restored and all votes are counted. In this meeting, we plan, will eventually plan an action to confront systemic racism. What kind of event? That's up to you and all of us together. If you, if you wish to receive uh, full information on November 7th event and our weekly planning meeting, please contact us through, through the site on, on these flyers. Um, and for those of you who are watching online, it's on your screen. You can always contact us, of course, to I see you, JP. And as soon as you join us, the more you will be able to help shape our work. So see you all on the 7th of November. Thank you. Why didn't the world listen to George Regas? How different would these last 20 years have been if the world and those in power had listened
to George Regas. My name is Stephen Rohde. I'm proud to be chair, along with Grace Dernis as co-chair of ICUJP. Fortunately, we have seen and learned a lot about George Regas today. I miss him so much. I loved him. I loved his spirit. I loved his mellifluous voice. I loved his sense of urgency. And the sadness of a program like this is how it wells up all of those memories and it deepens how much I miss him. It was a few years after 9-11 that George gave a sermon in this church on October 31st, 2004. It was such a powerful sermon that the IRS came after George Regas. They said he was mixing politics and religion. George beat back that lawsuit. They dropped it. But what lasts and continues are his words. He framed his sermon as a debate between Jesus and Senator Kerry and President Bush. It's a gorgeous sermon. We have notes about it in your program today, and you can go online and read George's entire sermon. At one point, he called out how deeply the world longs for peace. President Bush has led us into war with Iraq in a response to terrorism. War is itself the most extreme form of terrorism. Mercy brings mercy. Revenge brings revenge. Speaking from his face, faith, George said how Jesus mourns the death of those 3,000 people killed on September 11. Reverend Regus declared how, but Jesus also mourns the death, devastation, and loss in Afghanistan and Iraq, Sudan, and Israel, Palestine, and in so many other parts of the world. <clears throat> they too are part of God's precious human value. George imagined Jesus confronting Senator Kerry and President Bush, quote, I will tell you what I think of your war. The sin at the heart of this war against Iraq is your belief that an American life is of more value than an Iraqi life that an American child is more precious than an Iraqi baby. God loathes war. At the time of the trauma of September 11, you did not have to declare war. You could have said to the American people and the world, we will not respond in kind. We will not seek to avenge the death of innocent Americans by the death of innocent victims elsewhere, lest we become what we abhor. Why didn't the world listen to George Regas? The direct deaths in US-led wars worldwide since 9-11 are upwards of 800,000. The indirect deaths from war-related disease and water shortages are several times that number. These wars have created 37, 37 million refugees and cost over 6.4 trillion dollars. 
More than 7,000 American military personnel have died in these wars, and according to the most recent figures, over 50,000 have been wounded. More than 7,400 U.S. contractors were additionally killed, and more than 30,000 active duty personnel and veterans of these wars have died by suicide. Why didn't we listen to George Regas? The war on terror and the endless wars it has fostered, all built on lies and hubris, have been an abject failure. Detainees were tortured. Civil liberties were curtailed. Innocent Muslims were entrapped and targeted. Islamophobia has spread. The surveillance state has become entrenched. Police forces have been militarized. Drones have killed hundreds of innocent civilians, including children. The US military and the CIA have committed war crimes and atrocities with impunity. And xenophobia, nativism, racism, and violence has been normalized. Why didn't those in power listen to George Regas? Today, we remain inspired by you, George. We have been listening. We will not lose hope. We will not despair. And we promise to honor your memory by marshalling our capacity to shape the future for a new America and a peaceful world. After what we have seen today in this extraordinary program, I am personally filled with hope. Look at what George helped build. Look at the organizations, some of whom were doing long work before ICUJP was created, but so many have been created since then. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been an ambitious event today. Democracy is messy. We're so grateful to every single person who has played a role in today's event. We had an extraordinary committee of uh, organizers for this event. We were supported by the work of Vita Veach, Carol Francis Likens, Andy Griggs, Ruby Omar, Fernando Fernando, Stephen Fiss, Chris Ponette, Michael Novick, Susan Stauffer, Anthony Manousis. Today you saw the wonderful work of the giants on whose memory, whose existence we depend on, like the Reverend George Regas, Louis Chase, Steve Jacobs. We're grateful to Mike Kinman and All Saints staff for helping us put on this amazing event in the midst of this COVID pandemic. We're so pleased that Lowry Smith is here with us, and we miss Mary Regas, who is with family elsewhere, upstate, I believe. And we acknowledge people who are not present. First, a living person, Mike Farrell, who narrated one of the videos that you saw. But we also miss so deeply Pat Cromer and Margaret Lindgren and Leonard Bierman and Dr. Mayer Hatut. It is my duty to do two final things, uh, both of which I accept with a full heart. 
None of the work you have seen today, none of the work of ICUJP can go on without the resources needed to underwrite and fund the work of ICUJP. The special expenses in putting on an extraordinary event like this, and this is the moment to thank two other people. Sometimes people in my position throw around the expression, uh, none of this could have happened without so-and-so. I've said those words in other meetings and other occasions. I never meant them so deeply as I mean them in this moment, that this event, all of the planning, the ambition of honoring 12 organizations and Judy Chu, the daunting task of putting it all together so that we would have video elements and live elements in the same event. This literally could not happen without the extraordinary talent and professionalism of Robert Corsini. Robert, I love you for your passion, your compassion, your total dedication to the work in whatever project uh, you take on. Uh, anyone who wants to call on the talents, uh, we have an, an ad and an announcement of Robert's production company. He is doing a whole range of projects as we speak, and I am immensely thankful to you, Robert. And another person, Darren Kobata. Darren Kobata, our communications de director, and I think in these last few weeks she may regret that she is also our special events coordinator. <laughs> she has had to coordinate every single element of this program. Many in this audience have had the phone calls and the text and the emails from her to help bring this event together and to do it with high spirits, with humility, with great humor, with great skill. Darren, we are immensely grateful to you. Thank you. So this is the moment. If anything in this program today, here to those I'm addressing in person, and if anything anyone has seen on the broadcast and rebroadcast of this program, if anything has moved you, please consider donating to ICUJP. We're a small organization on a small budget with a part-time paid staff, but we have sustained ourselves for 20 years years. Thank you. Early in our life, Medea Benjamin, the powerful leader of Code Pink, had traveled the whole country speaking out against war. And she met with us and said, no group is doing what ICUJP is doing. And it has been about 15 years since she spoke those words. We know that there are demands for your contributions and donations. The very organizations we've honored call upon you. Other causes and needs in society call upon you. But if you can make for what is you a significant contribution, you can go to www.icujp.org slash donations and make that contribution. And you can go to 323-701-1467 to make a donation by text. 
In the 20 years of this organization, Wendy and I have celebrated four grandchildren born in these 20 years. Lexi, Charlie, Pete, and one month ago tomorrow, Hank. I have said often, and I say now, that I do this work because of Lexi and Charlie and Pete and Hank. And for the Lexis and Charlies and Pete's and Hank in your lives, and the Lexis and Charlies and Pete and Hanks in the families across this world. This is what we do this work for. My final honor is to introduce two extraordinary individuals who will close our event with a benediction. In September of 2002, the Nation magazine asked readers, what has 9-11 meant to you? And I wrote a letter to the Nation magazine. And among a variety of letters, they published mine. These are the words and the sentiments and the feelings in 2002. After the savage attacks on September 11, I felt scared, angry, confused. Days later, I found my way to an interfaith service at All Saints Church in Pasadena. I was deeply moved by the spiritual readings, prayers, songs offered by Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and others. Out of that healing event, we created interfaith communities united for justice and peace, which has been the center of my personal efforts to contribute to greater understanding and lasting reconciliation between people of all nationalities and beliefs. At a study group arranged by ICUJP, I sat next to an African-American Muslim teacher. He turned to me and said he didn't have a Torah. I responded that I didn't have a Quran. At the next meeting, we exchanged our holy scriptures. It brought us closer together, and we have become friends. That imam was Imam Sadiq Safir. Sadiq Safir organized a group of families who purchased storefront properties on West Jefferson Boulevard in Los Angeles to establish Majid al-Badila to serve the predominantly African-American community. It is committed to renewing faith, education, unity, family, civic engagement, and economic empowerment in South Los Angeles. Imam Sadiq founded the ILM Foundation, which stands for Intellect, Love, and Mercy, which we honored today in 1998, which was the product of his 30 years of community service and aims to teach life skills to economically underprivileged youth and adults so that social ills are replaced with opportunities for intellectual and economic empowerment. He is co-founder of the Southern California Shura Council and other institutions that have created a blueprint in Southern California social justice and interfaith spaces. Sadak is a dynamic speaker who has lectured widely. He is known for saying that a Muslim should be paid for his labor before the sweat dries on his or her face. And that if you as a leader are ever blessed with resources, never forget the founders. Never forget the workers. I looked ahead because he is also a founder of ICUJP. He will be joined in a moment by a native of Compton, Umar Hakim Day, who you already met, 
Umar is board chair of LA Voice. He's a graduate of the University of Phoenix and Claremont Lincoln University with certificates from Stanford University School of Design Thinking and USC. He's received an abundant number of fellowships from New Ground, the Adrian de Rothschild Fellowship, the American Muslims, Muslim Civic Leadership Institute, and Bend the Ark. And he received the 2010 Humanitarian Award from the South Coast Interfaith Council. He's been honored with a wide array of awards and recognized by Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez, Congress Member Brad Shaw, and LA City Council Member Jan Perry. In addition to all this, what I have personally experienced firsthand is that Umar has a big heart, a generous spirit, a lively sense of humor, and an abiding love of humanity. All of the qualities we need most in this world today. Ladies and gentlemen, Imam Sadiq Safir and Umar Hakim Day. Okay. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. I'm thankful to be in this situation. I thank those who came before me. I thank the mentors of the ICU JP. I'm very thankful for my mentor, Imam Sadiq Safir. Um, my name is Umar Abdul Hakim Day. I'm the leading director for Intellect, Love, and Mercy Foundation. And we've heard a lot of things here today, a lot of themes. I asked a question earlier. We know what brought us together, but the question is, what would keep us together? And one of the things that I've noticed throughout, one of the themes I've noticed throughout this program is justice. There's no justice, there's no peace without justice. What does that mean? When Jesus, peace be upon him, son of Mary, saw foul language and gambling in, his, in the place of worship, what did he do? He established justice in his way. The words tikkun olam means repair the world so we could have justice. In the Quran, it tells us establish weight with justice and fall not short in the balance. Because there are people, there are our neighbors. I don't know what city you live in, but you see them on the side of the road under a freeway. There's no freeway in California you could travel without seeing encampments. What is that? That's no justice. That is not justice. That is not why we, that is not, you know what I'm trying to say, that is not justice. But moving forward, we cannot leave here with just leaving the injustice in our hearts. We can't just leave it in our hearts. I see you, JP, is not that type of organization. The, the founders, the leaders, the community partners of this organization always push the line. Why? Because in their hearts, they have a hope for justice. Interfaith communities united for justice and peace is an umbrella of faith-based organizations. The common thread in that they all pay attention to what the Creator has promised them. They all have an innate DNA feeling and they striving to achieve what the Creator has promised us. And what is that? Justice. 
Justice. Say it with me. Justice. Justice. That's why we were born. To establish weight with justice and fall not short in the fall not short in the balance. So I'm gonna end with a with a prayer, a supplication. I'm I'm asking God, the Creator, to raise someone on this earth to help us establish justice. There's no way in the world the the, um, the brother who spoke earlier about all the monies that these companies are raising for Libya. There's no way in the world that somebody should go homeless with all that money. So I'm asking the Most High, can he grant this one person to rally us together for what? Justice. There's no justice without what? There's no peace without what? Please, do not leave this oppression in our hearts. From the people of color, the Latino communities, the black and brown communities. Um, you know what? Honestly, everybody needs justice. And I'm going to close by saying I acknowledge the land that we're standing on is the land of Tongva. I acknowledge that. And they were the first violated on this land. So we are fighting. We are in legacy of their prayers. Let us be the answer to that for justice. May God accept our efforts. Amen. Well, it's been a, an amazing day. Thank you for that blessing and that challenge. And uh, I challenge you now to go in peace, but to keep working for justice. We have some refreshments in the back. Please grab some as you go out and eat them out there and talk to each other. And we hope to see you at our next event but certainly on the streets, certainly working for justice. Thank you. Los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí. Everybody. De colores, de colores se visten los campos en la primavera. De Brillantes y finos se viste la aurora. De colores, de colores es el arco iris que vemos lucir. Y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí. Y por eso los grandes amores. Muchos colores me gustan a mí.